is Katerina Gregos. I'm the artistic director of the fair. I would like to say a couple of words about the panel and then hand over to Natalie Harchis, um, who is going to moderate the three consecutive discussion. Um, the panel, well, it's actually a series of three panels, uh, is called uh, The Role of the Gallery Beyond Commerce Towards a New Paradigm of Appreciation. And it is actually a collaboration between uh, De Appel in Amsterdam, where Natalie is the coordinator of the Gallerist program, now in its second year, if I'm not mistaken, and BAM, the Flemish Institute for Audiovisual Art. And we thought that the, and of course Art Brussels, we <laughs> thought that the fair, <laughs> um, last but not least, um, we thought that the fair was actually a perfect uh, platform to have a discussion on the role of the gallery today. Because it seemed to me, and it indeed continues to seem to me, that there is a kind of one-dimensional appreciation of the role of the gallery that is very often limited in the public consciousness to its commercial activities. Um, and I think uh, what we wanted to do is, in fact, through these three discussions, to highlight the multiple, diverse, and very important roles that galleries have in terms of production, presentation, publishing, uh, curatorial content, um, and also helping artists uh, in the production and the presentation of their work, either within the, in the private or, or the commercial context, but also within the context of museums, institutions, and exhibitions. And so this is precisely what this uh, series of panels wants to highlight and also complicate and deepen. Uh, I'd really like to thank Natalie for uh, taking the initiative for this panel, uh, and of course all the speakers who are with us today. And I'd like you to, of course, uh, hand over and you can introduce the guests and thank you all for, for being here. And please don't go away um, because this is the first out of three. So <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank you, Katrina. Um, yeah, so thank you for introducing me. My name is Natalie Hartjes. I'll get on with it because we only have a, a short hour to uh, uh, do the first panel discussion. Um, I'll first outline the departure point of uh, this panel discussion, then move ahead and introduce uh, our guests and we'll see how the conversation continues. So this particular first discussion is to focus on the collaborations and exchanges between galleries and institutions. And I hope uh, in a way that I throughout the conversation we can cut through a notion as if those operations are isolated operations to um, join us on this uh, discussion. I would like to introduce you first to Victor Giesler, who is a uh, director and gallery owner of May 36. I know I should say it in German, but then I will stumble. Uh, he opened May 36 in Luzern in 1988, and it is now located in Zurich. You would find his gallery in Hall 1. I uh, remember from uh, previous panels in which I've seen Victor speak that you describe your program as based around text and image. And um, Victor works with uh, well-known artists such as Matt Mullican, John Baldessari, General Idea, Lawrence Wiener, Rita McBride, amongst many others. Um, to his left, we have Jonas Jokaitis, um, who until 2012 or early 2013 uh, was one of two of Tulips and Roses uh, uh, gallery, first based in Vilnius and then in Brussels. Currently, he is curator of the Baltic Triennial, um, which we've spoken about a bit and is more taking shape as a swarm of ideas than your regular uh, exhibition uh, process. Stella Lohaus, who until 2011 had her gallery in Antwerp, is currently active as archivist of the lega artistic legacy of her father, Bernd Lohaus, recently initiated, held a new curatorial collaborative. And in her practice as gallerist, had worked very closely uh, with artists uh, such as Eric van Lieshout, Bjarne Melgaard, and Joëlle Tuurlings. Nathaniel Pitt, I would like to introduce, who is a, a gallerist from Worcestershire. He runs a gallery called Division of Labor, but next to that, a not-for-profit uh, operation called Pitt Projects, and is trained as an artist, and in a way, your gallery is maybe more an expansion of your artistic practice, I would say, in a way. So. That's for the introductions. Um, the first point I would like to bring on the table is that if we you know, want to investigate these roles and relationships between institutions and galleries, I think it's very important to kind of the line that as um, 
yeah, then calling the gallery also an institution, uh, th that they both serve a different purpose. I, I think, and maybe the panel members agree or disagree, but that in first place, a gallery serves the artist, whereas a museum or a more Kunsthalle-like institution would be there to serve a public, which is then, of course, brings some friction because a public is an abstraction and dealing with artists is like dealing with very specific individuals. So when working with these collaborations, it's trying to figure out a way where these different interests meet, I would say. So um, keeping you know that in mind as a starting point, um, maybe we could discuss um, um, a couple of examples of co-productions when you're uh, entering into a, a co-production uh, for a museum show. And um, Victor, maybe I, I can ask you how this relationship, what kind of expectations you're dealing with from the artist's point of view, from the museum's point of view, how you have experienced this. Yeah. First of all, uh, hello to everyone. And uh, as a gallerist, I uh, just want to make clear my point of view in terms of the base where I'm coming from. What I do is show, tell, and sell. These things haven't changed over the last 50 years since galleries worked with artists having work on consignment before people bought the work of the artist and they sold it. At the end of the day, an institution and a gallery, my point of view, we all deal with our culture. At the end of the day, if I'm becoming a billionaire, what I do is involve myself in our culture with artists I, I deal with through the gallery. The institution are very, very important for the artist because it gets the big show validation. We can learn, he can learn, we can meet the work. Things will be written about, publications come, etc., etc. From the day-to-day -day experience, I just give you the, the recent one I had. There is a big institution in Mexico, wants to do a show with one of my artists. Mexico is a far away. The Western world has some of the people not the best idea about Mexico. You know, there's always a little bit of offs and ends. The institution doesn't have so much money. They have a little money. It happens to be that uh, I know the work since 25 years. I have 80% of the archive with me. I represent this artist, that's what I do. So three of my people worked one month to put together, at my cost, this exhibition from our point of view. I helped them to organize the shipping because I knew what makes it cheaper. We got the works from some collectors, put it into the gallery, so it was possible to do it. And then, of course, there had to be a catalog, and there's another issue, who pays the catalog? Then, of course, you say, we ask for, let's say, 100 catalogs and make a contribution. I don't expect that the museum is going to buy work, so I have some rev revenue. In the end, this might happen if somebody there from the boards would give the money. The museum itself doesn't have the money. What I expect from the show for myself is that the artist himself, who decided finally to do the show, can do the best out of it. He sees his work, because it was a retrospective, evolved over the 35 years. And what I expect, of course, is that the public who visits the show gets to know the artist and they will see it maybe the next time, even in a gallery, even on an art fair, and from there on, I might have a sale, a sale out of it. For me, the institutions are partners. I myself, are in Switzerland, I think I am a member of eight institutions, also my family. We give them just, let's say, 100 francs a year to be a member. And I try to teach my children that they have to do that because at the end of the day, if they want to see art publicly, it's those institutions. It's no one else, it's on us. That's my point of view. Thank you. Um, we'll share the other microphones. Um, 
And thank you, Victor. Nathaniel, um, you've located your gallery uh, specifically in Worcestershire. Um, I sometimes talk about you as a man with a mission. Uh, because one of the reasons of having your gallery in a regional area of the UK is actually to connect to those institutions which are in the region and not in the centrifugal pool of London. Um, can you maybe talk a bit about like how you try to r reach out or collaborate and work with the institutions in your area? Yeah, sure. Um, so, Division of Labour is based in a rural city in the UK, which is Worcester. Uh, it's just, it's like uh, two hours north of London. Um, and I think there's probably a handful of commercial contemporary art galleries in the regions. And this is what I've based my model on to move out into the region. So I actually did the, the Apple course last year with Natalie. Um, and part of my hypothesis for that course was that I was interested in how other countries have regional collections and not just in the art centers. So how does Belgium have um, art within municipal galleries outside of Brussels, France, etc. So, because from my point of view in the UK, it is very London centric and most of the work uh, historically will remain in, in uh, London institutions. And within the cities throughout the rest of England, it's, it's, there's a pretty poor show of historic and valuable works. Um, historic from and valuable in terms, not just in terms of value, but in terms of importance. So it's a conscious decision to move and work within a regional rural location. And interestingly, w in terms of the public institution, I've recently opened my new gallery within a municipal gallery. So a public gallery is now housing my commercial space. And I've built like two white cubes within the space. So when you're in my gallery, you wouldn't know you were in a provincial gallery um, outside of it. So, um, yeah. So, so th this sorry. is this is actually a, a, a gesture of of the public gallery kind of investing in a way in your gallery or in its existence. And there's, I mean, there's many reasons why I'm doing this. For one, my wife's a head teacher and she's got a great job, and I don't want her to move. You know, <laughs> so and my family are here. So and it's a beautiful part part of the world. It's kind of a pilgrimage for the collectors that come to visit me. Because when they come, they've got nothing else to do but stay in my gallery. <laughs> so we can have a meal, we can uh, spend the we can spend the day together, we go walks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a really it's quite from that point of view, it's actually quite a good str strategy. <laughs> once once they're there, they can't go anywhere else. Um, but there are other. Th I, I'm quite serious in that. I think that the regions are. I mean, in Worcester, I could reinvent the last hundred years of modernism, and it would be like the newest thing in the world. You know, no, you could you could literally just replay the last 100 years. So it is important in terms of education and building a new collector base. But there, are, there aren't, realistically, there are no collectors, so art fairs are going to be really important to me as a gallery. In order to sustain your operations at home. And Stella, I mean, <coughs> kind of jumping back to uh, Victor's uh, statement or yeah. opinion, um, I assuming you agree in that like all institute both gallery museums kunsthalle are invested in this for culture but i would like to hear your um opinion on uh, the the sustainability of certain collaborations um yes i i think it's fantastic the way you describe it with the collaboration of an artist of your gallery in mexico unfortunately i think um in Europe or in Belgium or even in Antwerp, um, we do similar work. And I think in a certain sense, however, you can also expect a certain professionalism from the institutions. Because I think in many cases, of course, as a gallerist, you have worked with these artists most of the time already the longest. So you know the work the best, you know where everything is, you know, you have the whole overview which is different from a, a, a director of an institution or a freelance curator, but they cannot put all the work already always with a gallery because we have already enough work to do our own thing. But still, I think collaborations are possible. The difficult thing is, at least in Belgium, that it's not clearly defined who, like everything is oral in the art world, but also 
if you make then uh, agreements, at a certain point also if it's about money or the institutions pays a certain production cost for an installation, then it's difficult if it's not defined after the exhibition, what happens? If they want to buy it, it's okay, then it's abstracted, all the stuff. But it's not possible that, uh, that an institution which is funded with public money in invests in the production of an artwork and after a year, as a gallerist, you also work with this artist, you continue. So in which active s archive is now this work? Where is it stored? Who can buy it? Who can sell it? What is done with the divisions of the price? And I think in many cases, in any individual case, you can always find a solution because the artist, the gallerist, the institution, you all have the same aim. But I think there is a total lack of, uh, that it is clear that the things are put to paper, things change, and I so think that makes it confusing in the end. You're arguing for a clearer definition of responsibility. Yes, a clearer definition because, uh, yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, maybe, yeah, mayb maybe because I, then I have the interruption mic if I feel. This uh, is not only happening uh, in Belgium. I mean, this is in different areas. I give you an example. I had, um, Somebody in Vienna, pop, this was from the city, they wanted to do public projects, they approached an artist and they said, you know, we are producing this and the show is over, so what do you do with the work? I wasn't involved at the first stage. So they called me up because I'm the dealer of the artist and I said oh, to the artist, what do you want to do with the work? Then I said, you know, can you please store it? So we're talking about a gigantic thing. <laughs> so I said, Okay, okay, let me, let me think about it. And uh, then I asked him, you know, what's the deal here? Then I said, well, you know, they, they paid it, they made it, you know. So I called them up and said, you know, what's the deal? So it turns out that they wanted to have the money back, what they put in. Then I said, okay, now it's in my hands. We make a contract, give me the sums, show me what you paid. We do a contract. If somebody's going to buy the work, from the money I get, first you get the money back. But it might take years. After three years, if it's unsold, we have to close this. Either you get something from the artist, let's say a drawing or something like that, but of course they don't have a collection, so it doesn't make sense <laughs> for, for those. Or you know, the money has been spent and the artist has to work. And it's really a problem nowadays with all these uh, things going on to find a way like a, a structure like a paper structure what we did in switzerland for the gallery association we had created this kind of contract so we fought things through so each gallery who has a problem like that at least has a a way on paper to deal with the next with the partner mm -hmm. say, like, from our point of view, this is how we would deal it. So they, they, they can use this kind of a, a tool. Yeah, format, yeah. And um, um, please hang on to the microphone a little bit. I want to ask you another question from something you just said and connect that to uh, Jonas. You said for the show in, um, in Mexico, you, you had three people working on the show. That makes me think or consider on what aspects of the show did they work? Did, were they also um, part of the curation of the show? Because this is something which I think often in, in uh, collaborations between institutions and galleries, the galleries are, are very much a practical partner, <coughs> organizing a lot of the logistics and uh, the loan forms, etc., insurance, but then not often are consulted as an intellectual partner in, uh, as an archivist, as this knowledge. So as you mentioned, you had three people working on it. I'm very curious to, yeah. <laughs> well, to hear um, what they were working on. There were two, there were two people just on the uh, archiving, taking the work out, doing photographs of the work, making the package ready, trying to find the, the best shipping solution, mm -hmm. you know, and dealing with the other institution. Can you imagine what happens if you sell a piece to an institution who has a substantial budget, what's going on there, they want to have 
a trade build for special care, it, which you talk about Mexico. In the end, they wanted to send a curator with the crate to Mexico because they feared that in Mexico it will disappear because they had no relation. So uh, it needed me to speak to the museum director, to the conservator and say, hey, are you out of your mind? You know, <laughs> this is, it's not the Picasso we are dealing here, you know? And so I had to explain them I completely trust these guys, I have seen the place, and I have another artist showing there at the same time in another thing. It's all fine, mm. but this work you have to do, otherwise the artist won't get the work to be shown because it's, it's a sold piece, it's a loan. So you have to help secure yeah. the loan, so that's what on me. On me was also that the curator, of course, he knows the artist five years. Huh? I know the work 25 years. So when we meet three times, you know, when I developed, suddenly say, oh, wow, it's interesting. Uh, where is this piece? Where is that piece? And, you know, then you start and he gets things together. The artist was very happy because at the end, a lot of works went there. He didn't have time to, to talk to the collectors or the museum people. And then there is the physical aspect of getting the works to one place, pack it, crate it, photograph it, and get it over there, which involved uh, two people because it's a retrospective, so there are a lot of people, uh, a lot of works. And Jonas, in your time as a gallerist, did you, you know, um, experience this, you know, actual consultation of the institutions you were working for on the on the intellectual part of the work you were working with the, with the artist, or was it more like a practical uh, relationships? And how, yeah, how did you observe these these um, Encounters. Right. Um, I think in, in, in my experiences uh, with Tulips and Roses, obviously it was a gallery that like operated like for modest four years or something. So it, uh, I have not like uh, not a percentage of experience like Victor has, for example. But uh, I guess still I experienced like a similar thing that the, uh, the, the these collaborations between institutions and galleries are, are really uh, on a kind of like yeah individual basis, individual agreement thing. There's really no, uh, there's really no like fixed protocol as to as to how you do it and how you exchange. So everything was uh, like uh, all, all these like encounters I had were basically I had to either like kind of devise something on my own on how to do it or like phone up other gallerists and just ask for advice or <laughs> just like uh, or, or like or, or just uh, uh, be a kind of just like a have a frank conversation with, uh, with a curator, museum, like director, something, and just try to agree on something. So it, it really differs, and I think it's kind of unavoidable, just because it's so, like the, uh, every institution, all the pieces, like uh, all the every situation of artists is so different that like I don't think you can really impose like a kind of a like an overall structure. But uh, what you asked about was the kind of a more intellectual collaboration. I guess that, that, that also l really depends. Like um, I had instances where, where like uh, I would have a really in-depth exchange with a curator, like uh, and sometimes they would like pay a lot of attention and kind of really treat you as a kind of a, as a partner in that, as mm -hmm. a partner in crime, and, and, and you really would uh, have a lot of uh, exchange. And sometimes it would be much more formal. But so. I guess it really varies. It it really depends. Yeah. Um, and um, um, the, the, the thinking about this, like the exchange, and then you're also kind of uh, addressed on part of you know the, the the intellectual work you do yourself, and in w a way, I think in often, as in the case with your. Mexican exhibition, you know, galleries are addressed to be a support structure for something which happens in the institution. But I can imagine that you're also, the, in Nathaniel's case, like you are um, receiving an amount of reciprocity by being housed or homed uh, uh, by a public institution. And I mean, I would like to ask maybe like what kind of hope or what kind of support or, or how would you define or try to articulate the support you receive from a public museum, trying to think about it the other way or, uh, around. Like, wh wh what do you, in what way can a museum be of support for a gallery operation, beyond maybe just an acquisition, you know? Yeah, um, this, can, this can be a whole range, for example. Um, yeah, if, 
if people from the museum uh, visit uh, the exhibition or come to the vernissages, this is already like a form of uh, public recognition. It's mm. important that uh, the people of the institutions visit the galleries and see what happens there. Um, of course, they have a very busy list, so uh, it's not always the case with, with uh, all directors or so. They, they That's already one thing. Then I think if there are... Um, yeah, I don't know, it can be totally simple. It doesn't need to imply money. It can be uh, that there is a support uh, in the sense that uh, the institutions recognize the, the galleries, the role of the galleries. But um, I think the perception of a gallery can be very different in different countries or there are different... Um, I can feel, for example, in a country like Germany, uh, to be a gallerist is a much more honorful profession then let's say in Belgium where you do not have exactly the same tradition or you have a lot of more marchand, etc. So it's always, it's for the general audience, it's not always clear like what is meant by a gallery and the things that come in the press are always the, the exaggerations or the, the more mm -hmm. ugly things. So I think uh, definitely on a, on a uh, media level, the institutions can also convey a much more positive uh, image of the because we are also part of the of the sector, yes. I see, Nathaniel. I see you nodding. Uh, I'm. It's curious it's to see what spurred that on. Well, it's kind of different in the UK because obviously we've got Arts Council England. So, I mean, mo half the artists I work with are make public artworks, and then somehow I'm going to try and reintroduce this work, and it might be documentation of the work, or it might be the actual works. But that has already had funding you know, from a public institution. And the idea of, so already these sort of, if you can call them mixed economies, are, are happening all over, you know, with, with most galleries in the UK. Now whether, now whether you think that's right or wrong is, a, is kind of up to the how you deal with it and, and which restaurants you go to or <laughs> in terms of your analogy. Of, and in your analogy of sports, I had this crazy idea that if every municipal gallery in the UK had a local, um, had a local um, commercial gallery that was dealing in contemporary art, uh, we could enrich the, the regions uh, much more and maybe have in sports, in your analogy of sports, we could have sort of like a county level uh, support for, uh, for new art in the regions. So, it is, so the, the, the conversation between public and private for me is a really important one and museums can really enrich what I do. So in, in answer to your question earlier, I think, I mean, I'm only just starting, you know, I'm, I haven't had this experience of, um, but it's a strategic uh, move from on my part to actually work within the museum institutions in the regions of the UK. I mean, that's what I'm aiming for. It's, so. it's an aim for visibility as well. Uh, y yes, I mean, we all know that a, a galleries can exist without a public, you know, gallery to collect a gallery. Uh, and yeah. uh, um, but that isn't not that's not necessarily what I w want to achieve um, in the regions. That's why I'm out there, really. If that I makes sense. Yeah. In in, I wasn't expecting to ask this question, but now I'm just thinking about it. I want to hand the uh, microphone to Jonas because you first started Tulips and Roses in Vilnius, which is a post-Soviet country, and I wonder how that, in terms of traditions and <laughs> in funding structures and kind of you know, this public-private has uh, affected that. And maybe, did that make you move to Brussels eventually? This is a total uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, speculation. Well, it's even hard to kind of uh, really explain to, uh, to people who haven't kind of be been there, but um, basically there's no, there's no like real structure whatsoever, like in terms of art. There's one uh, institution, the Contemporary Art Center, which is, uh, uh, which is basically kind of uh, homonymous with contemporary art in the city, and there's like one uh, contemporary art gallery, which is uh, over there, Varte, uh, which is from Vilnius, and, and apart from that, there's really nothing. So uh, when we started, it was, um, it wa uh, and also like when I kind of started it, I was just out of uh, my philosophy studies, so I had, I had no previous experience whatsoever working in uh, the art, so it was, uh, it was really like a kind of, uh, makeshift thing like it kind of yeah th th there was nobody around to kind of tell you what to do and you had no clue so there was just just a bunch of artists i started working with who kind of just graduated 
and uh, and there was iron, but we kind of just like had beers and talked and uh, and and developed something like on the way, like by doing mm -hmm. shows and so on. So it was only after like uh, I think we did our first uh, art fair, uh, and then and uh, it was really like a kind of a complete adventure. Like we had no clue whatsoever wh wh what's it going to be or wh what effect it would. But like people bought some things and we thought, okay, this might be like something. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and, and then we kind of, uh, I started like trying to get a bit more serious and understand how to, how to do things or how to like uh, act as a businessman <laughs> and so on. So for a while I did that, and and Brussels was like a good place after because at a certain point we realized that we are basically spending like uh, the majority part of, 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 of our time uh, like just being abroad doing fairs and meeting people. So it wasn't really making so much sense to stay in Vilnius anymore. We moved to Brussels. And but in so the CAC, the Contemporary Art Center in Vilnius, it doesn't hold a collection. Is there any like N no. public collection which no. would be kind of like a reference for your practice as a gallerist there? Uh, no, there's, there's really no. The CAC is a kind of particular case because I don't know how relevant is actually in this conversation, but it's kind of a particular case because as as a sole institution in the in like or, or kind of really the, the main institution and the only one of contemporary art in, in the area, it it basically does everything. It like it kind of works like it doesn't sell obviously it doesn't collect but it works with artists almost like as a gallery because we really take care of all the documentation and archiving and, and kind of uh, curating on a kind of personal basis. We kind of they also act as a platform for all the local uh, curators so we invite like all the young guys to uh, and give them a shot at doing something. We also act act as a kind of the main kind of network inviting people from outside. So it's basically it's not like. Uh, it's not like uh, institutions, uh, say, like in Belgium, where you, you kind of have a similar model, but it, the, like there's several of them. So it's, it's kind of already a different ecosystem. And they're like basically one institution is contemporary art mm -hmm. in a way. So it's, uh, it's a bit different. And that collaboration was, was really kind of close. And it was really nice when we were there. Like we really had a like very close exchange with them. Um, in... in um I would like to, this is uh, another question uh, altogether, but seeing who will jump on it first, like how much do you think institutions need galleries and why? Because sometimes there's a bit in, in the, for, for instance, in a kind of like, you know, more leftist discourse, kind of like trying to be, step away from the galleries or, or trying to deny in a kind of like the, the ties to a, a commercial area. Um, but, you know, in the end, also the museums who try to pose that will, you know, eventually work with galleries and uh, ask for co-productions. But it would be something else. Like, what is the particular area of development of the gallery before something enters the museum? Yeah. Yeah. First of all, I think, um, and this is also good. Institutions also show artists that are not represented by a gallery, so they have different ways of working together. But um, the gallery and the artist work together, so if, if an institution wants to work with an artist but does not want to recognize that he's together with the gallery, then this is already a problematic departing point because indeed, as long as everything goes well, it's like ta -ta -ta, they do it together, and then who, problem, chup, and then often, at the emergency <laughs> state. <laughs> what do you mean with who, problem, chup? Well, <laughs> there are problems <laughs> in a certain sense unforeseen, and. I think sometimes in an emergency state and often the gallery is then in involved, but in an ideal situation, I think it depends. Every institution has a different moment that they focus on, a, on an artist. For example, you have a smaller uh, non-profit spaces, there it starts at an early career, then you have mid-career mid museums, exhibitions, group exhibitions, solo exhibitions, the big museums. And this may, be, may take a period of 20 years, but as a gallery, you are constantly with these artists, whereas as the institution, you always shift, ideally always go a little step higher. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the relationship with an institution sometimes is very temporary. And after five years, this institution is again focused on a new generation, and then the artist is not taken care of. So as the gallery is the one, ideally, that steps along with him or her all the parcours, I think 
um, I think it's really important because, as Victor says, we have we have the most knowledge. After a while, you cannot you cannot study it. What what you then have experienced after having done five or seven solo shows or, or even more. Uh, yeah. And uh, Victor, uh, having worked with some artists for over 25 years now, but also taking on younger artists, um, yeah, is there a, like a, a difference in in collaboration or a different way of approaching? institutions from based on the the moment in an artist's career and based on how long you have been working with a particular artist of course there is a change when you say 25 years and you see these artists you see the institutions and see myself when you look at a younger curator a younger institution and a younger artist you not necessarily want to connect it with the 25 year old history because we are all social, social human beings. So the young curators, the young artists, the young institutions, this is how it is. So when I'm trying, like right now, I have uh, see, seen something of one of the last uh, strange political situations on the planet. I bring in this art here to Brussels mm -hmm. against the regime. They don't know here we have a gallery from there which is the official gallery all the artists that's very official by the regime I'm doing it in a way illegally but nobody can do anything against it in the end this is a young guy and for that of course you would need a young curator you would need an institution to follow and then comes the tell aspect of the gallery so before I came here I had a long conversation with uh, a famous Belgian collector who I introduced the work and you do the whole telling and this immediately asked, does he get the show? Then I said, hey, in the country where he comes fo from, commercial galleries and institution, the way we know, they don't exist. This is just at the beginning. And of course, on the long run, if this might happen, it will be part of the of the gallery to do so. But I would say it changes, of course, with the, gen the, 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 the generation aspect is something, but basically it's the same. I mean, it's the same thing. You're trying to find uh, an interest, a public, a curator, then it goes into the early institution side, like a Kunsthall, something like that, some group shows, and then the first 10, 15 years pass, and then you get a little bit of a mid-career survey show, and then another five year pass, and then you try to get the first big institution shows. And um, this then, of course, goes from your, from, from your local area, from, let's say, from Europe over to other continents. And in the end, uh, in you have a world <laughs> artist who is all, all over, you know. In, in the way you phrase it, you try to get a mid-career, you try to get the retrospective. Um, in the articulation of that, it's very much as if the incentive of getting those shows within the institutions is with the gallery. Um, I'm going to look around the table now. Is that something which is recognized as that actually before... It's, uh, it's almost as appropriating the, the incentive or the impetus to do a mid-career show or retrospective is fueled or kind of catalyzed by the gallerist rather than the institution? No, this both ways. I mean, you know, your curator sees artworks all over, they discuss, they have their social network too. And they meet the artist maybe, and uh, ha or have heard, and they approach the artist, maybe he says, you know, I'm working with such and such gallery, they will help or talk to them. Or a curator, a museum person, sees the work with the gallery and or is connected with the mm. gallery and then you start the discussion they're all they're really all different layers and yeah. in the end it doesn't really matter who is who is first you know maybe i would like to jump from this question uh, back to nathaniel who you have been working with artists who you have uh called the sqps and then in those terms of kind of like what kind of um we have a few minutes left. Uh, I'm, I'm getting a gentle nod. But w in what kind of way do you perceive these SKPs and what do you try to do for them? 
Uh, I suppose it's a bit strange because I'm a young gallery, but I'm working with artists of my generation. I'm not young. So I'm working with artists. I'm a young gallery, but working with artists that may have, um, may have, been, may have missed um, some of the att attraction of the market because they've been working in public art or because they've been like they're international artists and they've been recognized internationally working abroad doing uh, responding to um, works but because it's public work they haven't necessarily been picked up by the market and I think that's what I meant by the escapees so I've got a couple of artists that I, I won't mention here because it's a bit strange to talk about them as escapees so <laughs> but it, in my head that I, I think these artists should be more recognized and more I think historically they're more important than the market values them so these are the artists that I'm focusing on. So I'm a young gallery, but I've got no young artists. So they're all my generation or older. But so, so you're actually doing like the, the route the other way around. You're taking artists who have been kind of, you know, confirmed uh, in an institutional sphere and trying to bring them the other way yeah, and have them uh, valued. Again, again, part of the UK, I think the problem is that in the regions, the, un the collectors and curators I don't know this for a fact, but this is a hypothesis that I'm testing, is that the curators in the municipal galleries in the regions will go to the art fairs and see the artists and actually uh, acquire work based on what's, what's, in the, what's current on the market. And actually some artists, I believe, have missed the market at some stage, maybe because of a blip of young British artists, this sort of thing has sort of pushed and distorted the market. And historically, I think, it might have distorted what's historically important to work in the UK anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm I do represent uh, a Lithuanian artist as well and a New York based artist. But I in terms of the UK and public and versus private, I think that's kind of part of my project as well, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about like a, a closing question because then we are actually already well through our time. Um, but I want to take a look around if there's any, before I pose a qu closing question, if there's a comment any one of the panel members would like to bring forward. And um, if not, then I actually would like to kind of like throw this to Jonas and ask him, uh, I, I witnessed Jonas in a panel uh, late January this year, and he uh, told a beautiful story about an art institution then that turned out to be a sauna. And in a way I've seen, which is kind of like so unrelated to the expectations of what this art space should be. And I would like to ask you to recap that question and maybe relate it a bit to how, because this is in a way how I saw tulips and roses function as a very strong curatorial experiment, but maybe a bit apart from the models which are imposed on a, a gallery. Uh, you, so you mean uh, like kind of telling the story of a sauna or? Uh, yeah. <laughs> because you're much better in like recapturing the very briefly this, <laughs> yeah. the idea of the sauna as an, as an art space. Uh, well, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Just to kind of t try to tell it briefly, it was basically it started uh, uh, like a couple of friends, uh, curators and, and architects and, uh, and 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 designers. They started uh, a sp uh, they, they wanted uh, basically to, uh, to 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 do projects like art projects in, in in Helsinki. And then one of them was like we, we took you from this idea of Alvar Alto to build a culture sauna, and uh, and and we thought like it should be something like a kind of museum slash sauna like very Helsinki specific thing and uh, the funny thing is that we kind of moved ahead very quickly and built the, the sauna uh, so it started functioning as an actual sauna but then we realized that the, the kind of the, the, the initial idea of making the, the, the kind of the exhibition space and sauna coexist doesn't make any sense because people <laughs> who come to the sauna they don't like interact like art with art like that it just kind of interferes with them so <laughs> and then when it kind of took over their lives, we realized that it's a full-on job to operate a sauna. And it, on its own, it's like a means of communication. It's like a specific place where people come and spend time and, and have conversations. And it's like, it's actually like a rich cult in culture in itself. So then we, we kind of shifted this, uh, this idea that it's not, that you don't have to like, like hang an artwork there, but like there's so many processes, social interactions and technological interactions that it's a medium on its own. So it's kind of that, that was very inspiring to me, just uh, just to think about it, how 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 yeah you can uh, do art, but then connect it to a whole different economy or a whole different uh, in a way like social ritual, 
and it doesn't need to be uh, an art space at all. <laughs> and do you think it makes sense to make that comparison between this idea of, of the sauna, the cultural sauna, and the gallery space, yours in particular, but maybe in general? Well, yeah, th th that would start like a whole different discussion <laughs> now. Okay. But, uh, yeah. but I think uh, uh, I think with a gallery uh, scene of a kind of a gallery network, it's much tougher to do things like that because it's still it's a much uh, it's a much more fixed system. Like there's a there's a very like uh, I think there's a tightly knit regime in a way of what an artist is, who an artist is and who an artist should do and uh, and what is an artwork and what is an institution how you're supposed to display it. So it's not that flexible. I mean, it changes over time, but I guess it's much much harder to, wen whenever you do something that doesn't really kind of subscribe to that economy, uh, you're kind of like a bit like out of it. So uh, it's not exactly a sauna situation. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great ending note. I want to thank you all, Nathaniel, Stella, Jonas, and Victor. Um, in about 15 minutes, our next panel in the series will start. Um, and we will be joined for that by Marie-José Bourqui, Elizabeth D., Sylvia Dodaire, and uh, JJ Charlesworth. Okay, see you in a little bit. Please hang on.